بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم uh, this is a very important subject uh, talking about the role of sharia in a democratic society and brings up a lot of, uh, of, of uh, things that muslims find themselves discussing often and things that are discussed about Islam often by non-Muslims. Uh, we've all heard, um, you know, conspiracy theories about the Islamization of America and how Sharia is taking over America. How that would actually happen is beyond me. I'm not really sure how people get these theories, but anyway. Okay, so the first uh, question to ask when discussing um, the Sharia and its role in Muslim, for Muslims in a uh, pluralistic democratic society is um, what is the nature of the, the land we live in and uh, although this is not mentioned in the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet uh, a, a division that's developed by Muslim scholars within the first about hundred years of Islam is the notion of Dar al-Harb, Dar al-Islam or the abode of war and the abode of uh, Islam or the abode of peace and uh, the abode of Islam is defined by almost all scholars as the place where the Sharia rules. Even if Muslims are a minority, uh, it's the place where the Sharia rules. Uh, one famous scholar, Imam al nawi died 1277, a famous Shafi scholar, he added another clause to that definition where he said that uh, even if, if, if there are a Muslim minority living in a non-Muslim state, but you're allowed to practice your religion freely and, and you're allowed to rule yourself according to the Sharia, then that can also be considered Dar, uh, dar al-Islam. Um, now, what the, another important division that's added into that in, in the same period, the early Islamic period, is the notion of Dar al-Ahd or Dar al-Mu'ahada or Dar al-Sulh, which is the abode of treaty or the abode of uh, agreement. Now these are places that are, they're not Muslim s states, they're not ruled by the Sharia, but they ha exist in peaceful treaties with the Muslim state. So Muslims can go and travel there and live there uh, and uh, um, do so with security. Uh, some modern scholars like Tariq Ramadan have discussed the notion of Dar Dawa, that there's another concept of land uh, today, which is the, the lands where Muslims can go and teach other people about Islam, Dara Dawa. Now, the general position of Muslim scholars throughout history has, that, has been that Muslims are allowed to live in non-Muslim lands. They're, al they're allowed to live arts outside uh, the abode of Islam, uh, provided they're able to practice their religion freely. And so, uh, some more skeptical scholars have said, no, you have to have a, a reason for being there. You can't just be there for no reason. You have to be there on commerce or as a diplomatic mission or to do da'wah. Um, something that's called maslaha shar'iya or something that has legitimate benefit, legitimate good. Um, but when you think about the role of, of Muslims in the West today, I mean, our very existence is sort of da'wah. So, I mean, I think that's been... I, I, that, that's a legitimizing feature of life for Muslims in the West or non-Muslim societies is that they are they're basically constantly existing opportunities to teach people about Islam and they in fact are the only representation maybe the only positive representa representation of Islam in those societies and it's very interesting that Im Imam al nawi I mentioned him earlier in his discussion of whether Muslims should or should not live under non-Muslim rule he said um, if they're allowed to practice their religion freely, Muslims should live under non-Muslim rule. If they, should, they should stay there and remain there because uh, it gives them a chance to do da'wah, it gives them a chance to teach people about Islam. And that is a, a, a very strong, legitimate good in, Islam, in the eyes of Islam. Um, one of the, the, the terms that often comes up when people are discussing uh, Sharia in non-Muslim context is fiqh ala qaliyat, fiqh ala qaliyat, which is uh, often translated as the jurisprudence of minorities or fiqh of minorities. I'm not sure who the first person to coin this term is. I think it might have been the late uh, Sheikh Tahar, Taha Jabra al-Wani, rahimahullah. I think he might have been the first person to coin this term. 
but it's become a very commonly discussed issue amongst scholars, especially in the West. Also, Sheikh Yusuf al-Qaradawi has a book on it, and uh, it's a, kind of the main theme of things like the European uh, Council for Fatwa and Research and other fatwa bodies in the West. They see themselves developing this thick of, of minorities. Uh, one of the things that is probably the main feature of this thick of minorities is that it's very flexible. It sees itself as being very flexible because it's, it sees itself as meeting unusual needs. The unusual needs of a community that's living, first of all, in a non-Muslim state, and second of all, in, in societies where there's often a good deal of hostility towards Muslims, either latent or explicit hostility. Um, but the question, it's also a very controversial issue, a very controversial concept, this jurisprudence of minorities, because it, uh, um, it, it comes with a danger. To what extent, when Muslims start taking advantage of the flexibility of their legal tradition, when they take advantage of, let's say, picking different rulings from different schools of law, or cobbling together rulings, or taking license or licenses here and there, uh, you start getting risking indulging uh, human desires, and even more than that, you start in in the name of responding to challenge to, to needs and pressures and necessities and dangers. You actually start you run the risk of. Um, reducing Muslims' capacity to really stand up strongly for their religion and the capacity of actually building a religious identity in those communities. And I'll get more into that, inshallah. So there's, a, there's certainly a need for jurisprudence of minorities, but there's also a cost to it. And there's always a constant attempt to balance between meeting the legitimate needs of the Muslim community and also not paying too heavy a cost in doing so. When we talk about uh, any issue of Islamic law, we always have to keep in mind the difference between thawabit and mutaghayirat. Thawabit and mutaghayirat. Thawabits are those rulings that don't change, that are never going to change in any circumstances. For example, alcohol is always haram. Uh, unless you're dying of thirst, it's, it's, it's haram. So it doesn't matter if you're in a place where no one drinks alcohol or in a place where everybody drinks alcohol, it's still going to be haram for a Muslim to drink alcohol. Uh, it's always going to be haram for a Muslim to uh, eat pork unless they're dying of starvation. It doesn't matter whether you're in a society where that's common or not. Uh, Mutaghayirat, on the other hand, are these laws that actually change based on place, time, circumstance. And the, the vast majority of the actual details of the Sharia are mutaghayirat in that they change based on time and place. Uh, it's important, there's a, a, an important legal maxim of Muslim scholars that uh, rulings change according to time, place, person, and system. Again, this is talking about the rulings that actually do change, not all rulings, but the rulings that do change will change based on context. And I like to, to think about these as the, the contact surfaces of, this, of the law. These are the places where the, where the law actually meets society, the contact surfaces between the law and society. So, for example, if you talk about things like um, Mahar, how much mahar does a, per, does a husband pay? This, you know, the, the mahar is fixed. Husbands always have to pay a mahar. But it, how much that mahar is, this is totally based on time and place. Uh, what are the expectations of a spouse towards each other? What is the husband's job in the house? What is the wife's job in the house? These are also uh, changed based on time and place. Uh, things like um, a good example of, 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 of thawabit versus mutagayirat, the aura, the aura of a man is always his navel to his knees. The aura of a woman is always the aura of a woman. But that's, you know, in theory, I could come and give this lecture wearing, you know, a towel wrapped around my waist going down to my mid to my knees, which would be really weird, yeah? I mean, that my aura would be covered, but it would be totally inappropriate. Because there's another level of dress beyond the aura, which is your notion of appropriate dress. And that notion of appropriate dress, although uh, it, it will change based on time and place. So a lot of times Muslims get so caught up in the aura, they forget there's, it's not just your aura that determines how you dress. 
There's also notions of appropriate dress, which uh, differ in time and place. You know, when you look at descriptions of uh, Muslims in, in what's now Malaysia, Indonesia, in the 1500s, when European travelers would go there, they'd, the men would wear a, a sarong, so they would have their kind of their navel to their knee with a, like a wrap, and then they just have maybe like a, a piece of cloth around their neck or something, but they were, they were topless, basically. That's how the men dressed. And that was totally normal in their society. If we walked around like that, that would be extremely unusual. But in both are Islamic, and in both cases, our auras are covered. But it's a, that's not the only notion of, the only rulings of Islamic law. So for example, if I walked around with just a towel on all the time, I might have my aura covered, but I would not be considered adil. I wouldn't be able to give witness in court. I wouldn't be a respected person. I wouldn't be able to hold a lot of public, uh, positions of public office in a Muslim society because I'm not actually a, a person who's, up, who's upstanding character. Okay.